Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here. Today's panel is on building a global brand and lifelong learning. We will be focused on both aspects of that, the lifelong learning part and then the global market part. And we have a really amazing panel today. You'll hear them introduce themselves throughout uh, the panel uh, through, through the various questions. And um, just starting with lifelong learning, I think it's um, a very interesting part of education because in some ways it's the, the least formalized part of education. It doesn't have the same structure and professionalization as K-12 or pre-K. Um, but it's become increasingly important over the past few years. Um, it's something that I think a lot of universities are sleeping on. Uh, we see a lot of, even here today, companies that are stepping in to you know, provide value in this space. Um, but there is one university that has decided to um, place it at the forefront. Um, and so I actually want to start with you, Meredith. Um, You've mentioned before that ASU has three pillars and lifelong learning is one of them. So we'd love to hear about what is the importance of lifelong learning? How does that fit into the ASU picture? And do you think other universities should do something similar? Absolutely. Well, first, thank you so much for having me today. And thank you to the audience. I know we might be the last thing between you all and the first reception of the evening. So we really do appreciate your presence. Um, but I think you know we are seeing technology change the world at absolutely lightning speed. And that means that individuals from every educational background, regardless of whether they haven't completed high school or they have an advanced degree in a technical field, will need to keep learning throughout their lifetimes to keep their career skills fresh and to thrive in their lives more broadly. And lifelong learning means giving individuals the opportunity to gain new skills, new experiences, and new knowledge at every stage of their lifetimes. And it's the opportunity to foster economic and social advancement that motivated the creation of ASU's learning enterprise, which we established a couple of years ago as the third pillar of the university in addition to our academic enterprise and our research enterprise. And the mission of the learning enterprise is, as I said, to foster economic and social advancement at every stage of a learner's lifetime from pre-K to post-retirement. We currently have, we, we use the same faculty expertise uh, powered by over 5,000 ASU faculty, the ones that are building our academic programs, um, to build education programs that range from uh, foundational learning programs, which facilitate uh, pathways to college and success in college, to career skills programs, and uh, personal, cultural, and civic learning programs. And we've now, uh, on this uh, journey to date, created over 1,000 offerings that are serving more than 310,000 learners annually. Thank you, Meredith. So before we get too far into this panel, I think we, we have to define what lifelong learning is. As the panel met before, we were trying to figure out what is the definition of lifelong learning, and Everyone has a different approach on it. So I want to start with you, Marnie, at Coursera. How do you all think about lifelong learning? And in particular, how do you find focus within such a broad category? Great question. Uh, at Coursera, I, that's a really good question. because, And it's a really important time to be asking the question because we are starting to see where before lifelong learning was a set of, pl of programs that happened later in life. So you go through high school, and then you get your degree, and then there's lifelong learning. Um, now I really believe, as you just described, lifelong learning is, is a set of intentional pathways. So we know that if you are going to carve out a career and build your own brand in the knowledge economy, that is a lifelong endeavor and you need a lifelong partner or a set of partners to help you do that. And that's the way I feel like we see it at Coursera. Coursera is, as you say, a massive catalog, but when you think about what it really is, is it's, it is intentional sets of open content, MOOCs and specializations, um, professional certificates, as well as pathways into degrees that would allow a person to chart a course chart a journey across a discipline like data science or technology or even health. Um, and more and more at Coursera, we're seeing the importance of Coursera helping as a navigator in that journey, um, whether that journey starts in high school or whether that journey starts after a layoff um, um, in mid-career, anywhere in between, all the way up to the, <laughs> to the um, 
to the years like I'm getting into myself where you're just learning for learning's sake. Um, that's what Coursera is, and I think we really are starting to take that responsibility for guiding the journey very seriously. And so, Mike, I want to go to you next. Uh, with Emeritus, uh, a lot of similarities to Coursera, but also differences. Do you also see this role of lifelong learning as you know, also providing the navigator through this? How, how, how have you found it serve your, your unique spot in this space? Definitely the navigator, as well as I would say the difference between just having the learner find their own path and a more curated way of future-proofing yourself. And I think that's another definition of lifelong learning is how do I, as a learner, as a person, prepare myself for the unknowns of the future? The last five years have taught us that you cannot predict what's going to happen next year. And whether it's chat GPT, a war in the middle of Europe, a global pandemic, that is going to be happening more and more frequently at greater speed. So how do we future-proof ourselves? Becoming a lifelong learner is key to doing that. And what I would say is that the reality of many people is that we are by nature, I'll talk about myself, I am by nature kind of a lazy, curious guy who loves to learn about little things and tidbits but I need help to really find that pathway that, that you're, you're talking about, Marnie. And the, so those of us who can provide that pathway, and Emeritus is working with over 80 universities, very similar number to Emeritus, about Emeritus number of 300,000 learners a year. It's finding pathways for people, helping them curate their own lifelong journey of learning. So, what we've been talking about so far is uh, your organizations cover a wide range of um, courses. Uh, I want to go to Julio next because I think your focus, you have a, if I'm not mistaken, Domestica has a strong focus on creatives. Um, you also started in the Spanish market, have now expanded beyond. But I think that that focus, that pretty strong focus is somewhat unusual on this panel. So I want to hear more about how you all think about that. About exactly why focus on creative? Yeah, exactly. In lifelong learning, why focus in these areas? And in the process, tell us a little about what Domestica is. Well, we, we are an online learning community for creative people. And we, we started as an online community of a basic forum in Spanish. So sometimes we say that we didn't create a company. The company created by itself. <laughs> so we didn't choose. That was our, that's where our fields, our passion. So that's how it happened. So... Um, um, but at the same time, we usually say that 85% of the world population is our potential target because we are all creatives, right? So uh, that's, that's it. And Falgan, you also um, had a focus starting in India and have also expanded beyond. We will talk more about that global expansion process, but we'd love to hear your take on what lifelong learning is and how you find focus in this area. I'll not repeat uh, what has already been said, uh, but I think one of the other ways that we try to think of lifelong learning is an intentional mindset and attitude to invest in pursuing the most exciting career possible, right? Because all of us, I think one of the trends that we see, not just in India, but globally, is that if you looked at the average age at upgrade for an employee is about 30, and in the last 10 years of their career, on average, people have already changed three jobs. Right? And that's only going to move fast in terms of their roles, uh, the company, et cetera. If you look at their parents, they would have probably changed three jobs in their whole career of 50 years. Right? So I think with the change that technology brings, it's very unpredictable. So you don't know what the long pathway could look like. But I think having that very intentional mindset and attitude to say that I'm constantly going to learn and invest in making sure that I can pursue the most exciting career and for myself, I think is very important. That's something that we're trying to build. And as Upgrad specifically, I think when we think of lifelong learning in the higher education space, we say uh, 18 to 80 years old, right? Uh, and when somebody starts thinking of their first undergrad course to 80 years when they're working, I think what can Upgrad do in that journey to be the go-to platform to make sure that learners can get strong outcomes uh, when they build this mindset of lifelong learning is how we think about it. And so let's build off that. You mentioned that people are changing, changing jobs every two or three years. 
Uh, obviously, the theme of ASU GSV, even if not explicitly stated, is AI. Um, and so jobs over the next 50 years are going to look very different. And I think you all have sort of a unique vantage point on what are the most, actually, maybe I just bring it down to one. If you had to pick what's the most important skill or content knowledge that you would want a large portion of the world to learn to be equipped for the 21st century, what would that be? Feel free, anyone can jump in here. I can probably start. Uh, if it's, I would say that the most important thing, as I said, that I believe is gonna help folks uh, over the next few decades in their career is just intention and curiosity, honestly. I think things change very fast. As long as you have strong intent and you're curious uh, and you have that attitude, I think that will hold you in great stead as you continue to build. Yeah. I was and, gonna say the same thing, but since you already said it, I get to say my second word which is confidence, like the, the intersection of curiosity and the confidence to ask the question, to create the prompt, to chase the micro-credential or sort of build, build your profile, um, not just once when you're 18, but always and evermore <laughs> as you're building out your career. I think that's gonna be really important as well. One quick comment on that. I do think you know, learning new technical skills is going to be continually important, right? We're seeing technical skills evolve so incredibly quickly. Um, for some of our technical skills courses, we have to literally update them multiple times a year now just because of how quickly programs are changing. But I think it's also crucial that learners have these human skills like communication or emotional intelligence or working with others, which although their application can change, right? Like now we can have chat GPT compose an email for us. We still need the human skill to say, is email the right medium of communication? Is the tone of the email appropriate uh, given my relationship with the recipient? So I think those human skills, uh, despite uh, the automation of many tasks, are still going to be very important. Do any of you have courses on your platforms about how to use ChatGPT? Stay tuned. It's coming soon. <laughs> it's coming I would soon. be surprised if all of us don't have it like now or in the next few months. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And, and, and Drew wanted to say also, I, I think there, there's a concept of learning agility, which I think is really critical. Basically, how to become a better learner. That's a core skill, a meta skill that all of us need to embrace. And it has the confidence, it has the curiosity. It's also embracing risk. If we're not ready to embrace some risk, we are never going to learn. And getting out of your comfort zone, that's where the learning happens. So embrace the risk with confidence, with curiosity, and build a learning agile mindset that's gonna be key to success in the future. So I wanna make sure this panel is not all just roses, that we also talk about the real challenges here in lifelong learning. And I sort of alluded to it at the beginning, which is this is not a very defined space. You know, of course, when MOOCs came out 10, 15 years ago, the big narrative was around completion rates were very low. Um, there's this huge gap between intent and actual you know, success and completion. and um, I know it's not talked about quite as much, but I imagine this is still underneath the surface and all of your programs is trying to think about how to maximize retention and completion rates. So we'd love to hear more about sort of these sides of lifelong learning and how you all are handling it. A first conversation this morning and talking about using generative AI chatbots to help learners. And, and this is with one of our university partners and I love the way this was framed. It's like, we're all into experimenting with you. So, so at Emeritus, we're doing this in a very iterative, small experimental way. You know, training chat on deep diving into a particular course where we have permission to do this and then seeing how the chat responds to learners' inquiries and the number of responses and, and qualities on that. And the partner university said this morning, love it, except <laughs> it's gotta be proven that this is higher quality and what are the metrics we're gonna be using to measure the quality for the learner. I don't wanna just see this being a benefit for you streamlining your operations. And I think that challenge would come to any of us right now. So how are we using generative AI to make it a more powerful learning engagement? So putting learner first, not just as a back room off, you know, operational play, which I think some people are thinking of too. I do think that, um to your question, lifelong learning 
beyond a formal credential is generally about developing skill sets and verifying skill sets. Um, whether that verification is a formal verification or an informal verification at work. It's about building out your profile of skills and your mastery level in those skills and your depth and your breadth in those skill sets and dispositions. And so I think your question about completion is really interesting because that is one of the big challenges. It's not only how do we engage that learner in a course or a certificate or a specialization, but how do we retain and get them to persist and engage? And then yes, for some, how do we make sure that we could, they complete and get that uh, achievement? But I think one thing that's important to remember about this, this sort of realm of learning is that for many who are engaging in it, it's not about completion. These aren't degree programs. These are deep dives into skill sets um, that people can come in and out of fluidly <laughs> and decide whether or not they need to complete or not. And I think that's one of the things that makes lifelong learning like difficult to measure with a sort of incumbent traditional higher education mindset, because uh, it really is way more informal and fluid, and I think ChatGPT um, creates yet another level of informal learning on top of it. We just announced last week at Coursera Conference um, the Coursera Coach, which is again like similarly trained on um, course content and disciplinary content at Coursera on top of the, all this amazing expertise that we have. Wonderful, you can start asking Coursera coach questions about particular topics, their application. How, how, does, this, how does this work in this sector, sector, in this field? I have a team, how could I apply it to my team, right? That's really informal but powerful learning where that really encourages the velocity of curiosity in, in learners. How do you measure that? What does, you never complete that, right? And so I think that's one of the things in this field of lifelong learning we have to grapple with. What are the metrics that we're chasing with these learners? Is it persistence? Is it completion? Is it achievement? Because um, it's a different paradigm. Yeah, let, let's follow that thread because, again, the conversation 10 or 15 years ago was very much how many people are completing the MOOC what you're bringing up, uh, Marnie, is that in lifelong learning, we have to redefine what success is. So how do you all redefine that? And Julia, I wanna go to you because, yeah, you may have similar thoughts on what does it mean to be successful as a creative. Well, <clears throat> it, there's two words that we keep using in domestica always when we talk about these things. One is meaning and the other one is identity. So this is not about content, this is not about classes, courses, we say, well, how can you achieve meaning, usually in, in a social context, with others? I mean, doing these kind of courses with others give you the right meaning. And at the same time, you build your identity. But now we're facing this challenge about those two key words for us. Okay, what's meaning going to mean in this new context? Or even worse, what's going to be your identity in this context, the identity of the student in this context. I mean, we are, we don't know, but it's quite, quite exciting to be honest. Yeah. I think that's actually one thing that's incredibly exciting about building a lifelong learning portfolio is that the success for a learner looks completely different depending on what audience you're serving. For example, in our foundational learning portfolio, uh, success might look like earning admission into the university of your choice. For our, uh, we, we also have a portfolio um, of programs that we offer to Mirabella residents where we're serving individuals who are in their post-retirement years. And for success, success for them might actually just look like learning for, for the joy of learning. So I think um, really deeply understanding the needs of your audience uh, at, for the given program is crucial, of course, in designing programs that meet the success that they're looking for. And just to add to that, I think, I mean, I was thinking that my answer would be uh, delivering on outcomes, but that is as vague as what is success, right? What do outcomes actually mean? Uh, so just to go back to the original question on uh, lifelong learning and the challenges there, I think it's easy to say 18 to 80 as a homogeneous group, uh, but 
I think when we started Upgrad back in 2015, we were very focused on, let's say, 25 to 35 years, where we said there are working professionals, they have a job, they need to upskill, they want to do something else, and it's a good, it's even there, for example, in that 10 year age group, when we ask people what their desired outcome is, we get multiple responses. We have internally clubbed it and said, okay, there are three broad outcomes that people are looking for. One is movement to a different company in a different role. Let's say they're a software developer in Infosys and want to become a data scientist in Google. Or second, they say, okay, I love my company, but you know, I want to be promoted to a project manager or some other role. And the third is to say that I'm happy with my company, happy with my role. I just do this to build professional confidence where I've been doing marketing for 10 years. I just want to understand the latest in digital marketing. So even in that group, there are various motivations that drive people. Uh, so the product value proposition and the stakeholders that are involved are very different for various categories of this 18 to 80 life cycle, right? So for example, 18 years is when somebody's doing their first undergrad course. Their parents are much more involved in the decision making and they're a key stakeholder, right? Their social interaction becomes much more important than for a 40 year old who is learning data science, right? So I think the challenge is that it's difficult to treat this as a homogeneous group and you need to be very careful of what the specific outcomes expected in each of these are and then think of the product value proposition, right? So for us, that's been the biggest challenge as we expand uh, to answer your first question. And second, what success looks like. I think in each of these, my answer was outcomes, but it's very generic, so that's why I said all of this before, but I think we de specifically defined what outcomes mean for each of these based on what that category of learners are looking for. So I wanna make sure we get to the global aspect of this, and we're very lucky to have all of your organizations have a global presence, and I imagine there was a time when you didn't have a global presence and you had to transition. Uh, so I'd love to hear from a few of you your stories of what was that experience like to go from one country to global, think about the localization, changing your outcomes and how you conceive of your organization. Um, would love to hear some of the war stories associated with that. So who wants to share? I'll start from the other side because in 2011, I met one, you know him, Falcon, one of the founders of Emeritus, Ashwin Damara. He was traveling from India. I didn't know Ashwin. I didn't know Eruditis. He's a young, bright guy. It really impressed me. But we were already experimenting on our own and trying to do a lot of our own online programs in executive education at Columbia Business School. Great meeting sort of forgot about it. Six months later, I do some mystery shopping on some really innovative designs coming from pure schools. And I realized Emeritus was behind those designs. Very quickly, I'm saying, hey, Ashwin, looks like you're doing good work with somebody else. Let's talk. Long story short, so I was both at Columbia and at Wharton, worked with Emeritus as a school partner and just saw what they brought to us. So they started from India always with the objective of working with the best-in-class global brands, bringing it to the rest of the world. And it's almost been the inverse. So from India back office, they were powering US brands like MIT, Wharton, Columbia, Berkeley, yada, yada. They then started investing in IIMs, IITs in India. And right now, we're about 30% North America. 18% LATAM, 22% India, 18% rest of Asia, and leaving about 10%, which is mostly Europe, but Africa as well. And Africa is obviously growing very quickly. So I love the story of the great minds and competitive mindset of India focusing on the developed world and then back channeling into the emerging world. And that's where the fastest growth is happening right now. Yeah, just from- uh, Fastest growth is in India. Yeah, for you all. Anyone else? Fastest growth in India? We have a, a fast, growth, in fast. Gr growth in India, and it's one of our largest uh, populations globally. And I just, I was sitting here thinking how to make this into a war story, but it's not a war story. <laughs> so, but I, but Maybe I. a peace story as it's well. It's a peace <laughs> story. It kind of is a peace story. Um, but I, I do think the other interesting thing that kind of we're seeing, so very similar model, working with very similar higher education institutions at Coursera. Um, but I think what's really interesting globally right now, we just did research, uh, I think it was released recently, it's on the Coursera blog around learner mindsets. 
around short form credentials and micro credentials that are industry recognized or industry endorsed. So over the last few years, um, there's been a lot of chatter. Well, learners don't recognize them. They don't know what the currency is. Um, employers don't recognize them. They don't understand what they signal. Well, this research sort of like, oh, here's the war part. It slapped that, that set of assumptions in the face in the sense that um, in research that we did with over 3,000 students in Australia and India and Turkey and the US and UK and South America, what we found was that learners indeed are looking for industry recognized and endorsed certificates across um, age demographics. So the same certificates across the age demographics and that employers are valuing industry recognized and endorsed certificates as a signal for employability. And I think I looked at the map so that when you look at that research, there's this beautiful map with sort of looks at all of the locations where we were doing the research and the companies and the, the learner profiles that we were looking at. And it was incredible to see the kind of the unified shift in mindset around short form credentials that's happening globally. Uh, and I, I frankly find that very interesting, and I also find it interesting that these lifelong learning assets, you might call them, these skills-based micro-credentials, um, they are defying age as the primary kind of, like we think in higher education, high school, undergraduate, et cetera, these certificates, the Grow with Google certificates, meta certificates related to becoming a data analyst or a, um, a, da a digital marketer, et cetera, they're as attractive to high school students as they are to people who are career switchers. They are great companions to undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees. And I think that's really pretty fascinating, uh, especially that it's happening in a unified way kind of at the scale of the world. Yeah, so I think for us, uh, we work with, when we start, again, about three, four years back when we were predominantly in India, I think the journey was that we were working with universities globally, but we were delivering courses to Indian learners. So because US education or student education is global standard, so Indian learners have the aspiration to do that. So we were delivering it mostly to Indian learners. But I think very soon we realized that uh, without Upgnite doing much, about 10% of our learners were coming from the rest of the world, uh, just organic. Uh, and honestly, uh, very honestly, this was mostly the Indian diaspora abroad uh, because there was some rub-off effect in marketing. But we, because of that, we just got a sense that, look, 10% is not a small number and we're not doing anything. We're not spending a dollar, we're not doing SEO, nothing, right? So that's where we started thinking of, we have some of these international products which could very easily work. Obviously, we'll have to change some examples, we'll have to change the te teaching assistants, et cetera. But it looks like there is uh, latent demand for a high quality solution in some of these markets. And that's where we then expanded back in 2019 to Southeast Asia and Singapore, Vietnam, Middle East, and then the US. And I've now moved to New York, uh, just because it's a very exciting market and there's a lot that we can do. Uh, war stories, I don't know, but I think one of the things that always freaks me out whenever we look at a new market is obviously we do our regulatory diligence and get in. But the speed at which the regulations change in some of these countries I think is fascinating and it's extremely scary. Uh, for the US, I mean, there was an announcement a few weeks back which was like out of the blue and that could have completely changed the complexion of what we wanted to do. Similarly, we entered... Wh which announcement was this? This was, <laughs> this was the dear colleague letter that came out a few weeks back from the Department of Education. Uh, so, again, now there's a lot of change. They've changed some of the uh, regulations, which is good. But I think that's been the most exciting and scary part of entering some markets like Vietnam, where suddenly the government decided that they don't want to allow distance online education from international universities, or in Africa. Uh, so I think regulation uh, is something that's always been very exciting and adventurous for us as we enter new markets. Mike has a comment about regulation. I, I, I've just been ruminating on this because of the DOE in the US, and I really think the regulatory bodies in so many different countries are legacy-bound entities that are under the name of consumer protection or education protection are protecting the legacy systems of education. So those of us who are trying to innovate and even great amazing state schools like ASU can be hamstrung by 
overreaching legislation. And, and you're right, Falcon, it, it's happening in every point of the world. Yeah, we, we've certainly seen that, I would say, at ASU. And we actually, uh, well, first, connecting back to your point, Marnie, I do think that there's been an incredible convergence of the types of skills that are needed. If you look at various international geographies, it's the same thematic areas that are in demand. So I truly believe that the programs we're developing are really globally relevant. But the question is, how do you actually scale those globally? And we've found that having local delivery partners can be incredibly helpful in you know, really driving learner recruitment in, in international geographies. And so in 2019, ASU uh, co-founded Sintana Education with Doug Becker um, to essentially establish a network of international universities that are powered by ASU. And so the Sintana Network universities are able to enroll directly in ASU online courses, um, but we benefit from the international network where the universities actually uh, support local student recruitment, et cetera. And that really helps to mitigate some of the barriers of the local regulation and local environment. And, and localization, that's that at uh, Coursera, the Coursera for Campus offering is in a way similar, which it allows uh, universities around the world to take advantage of the open content catalog as uh, courses, specializations, uh, and the gateway certificates, and to sort of basically bring them into their educational pathways or as co-curricular resources, um, their faculty, their instructors, are localizing that content in the context of a particular degree program or course or in, a, in the context of a particular geo. And I think that's an incredibly powerful way to use some of these lifelong learning assets that are coming out of Coursera or, or ASU or other, other institutions. It makes them, makes them, I think, 10x more powerful um, um, when they are deployed. Okay, we're gonna open it up to questions in a few minutes. Um, so start preparing your questions. Um, but the last thing I want to implore of all of you, sort of a joint problem for all of you to work on, is we, you know, we talked about at the beginning how this space is broad, not always the most well-defined. Um, 50 years from now, is there a world where there is an alignment of certifications and credentials, an alignment of what different countries are doing, an alignment of what the regulations are. Is there a world where lifelong learning is in every university or there's other institutions that are the home of this? Is there a world where there is some standardization? And is that a world we want or not? Would love to hear from some of you. Did you say 50 years from now? Or? 50 years from now, oh, okay. so GPT-27. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> so I, I think one thing that I would love to see 50 years from now, in fact, I would love to see this five years from now, is um, lifelong learning needs a new currency uh, for achievements. Uh, we can't use the credit hour for lifelong learning. It barely makes sense in traditional higher education. It certainly doesn't make sense in non-traditional informal education. So I would hope that by 50 years from now, we'd have a global currency for skills-based, competency-based education that is interoperable um, and that is meaningful and uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, especially given that these skill sets are becoming global skill sets, especially given that um, humans are now digital nomads living and working all over the world, it was sure would be great to have a skills-based currency uh, for lifelong learning achievements into the future. Okay, so skills-based currency. Sounds pretty good. Anyone have other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, to be very honest, I struggle to see past five years with how things are changing. Uh, so I don't want to put in like too much of a visionary in terms of what will happen 50 years down the line. But if I had to take a guess, uh, I would say that I think we should have, uh, like she was mentioning, a platform or a interoperable and transferable skills or some form of credential slash credit structure so that students can build on that particular stack and can move across globally. And I think that's going to be very powerful. Is it going to be skill-based? Is it going to be something else? What that currency is going to be, I don't know. But I think there will be a common uh, currency and platform that will ensure transferability and interoperability across the world. And I think that's going to be very powerful. Any, 
any thoughts beyond it? I would say that I hope in 50 years learners have the opportunity, all learners, all individuals have the opportunity to learn what they need to learn when they need to learn it without any barriers to that opportunity. And, you know, I think our work in learning enterprise, I certainly hope, uh, is an inspiration to other universities, but also, you know, more broadly to the broader ecosystem of education providers, um, like many of you in the audience and here on the panel today. These are yes and, yes and, yes and. So I, the only thing, you did talk about the regulators. There's too much agreement on this panel. No, no. I, 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 I've been trying to take out disagreement. Let, let, let me say. But this panel's making it really hard. Within <laughs> um, 15 years, I hope we can all celebrate that the regulators have sort of decided, you know, we can't protect the past, so let's fuel the future mm -hmm. and allow us to continue to innovate even more than we have been. And one other comment I'd like to make is that three of us on this panel are serving universities, and we have to. We make it easier for universities to innovate. We do things that universities can't do on their own. ASU is the amazing exception, and you kind of wonder why ASU is sponsoring this event. You've been doing this for 15 years. You pick up so many innovative ideas, you collectively ASU, that it's a brilliant strategy, but you're so unique. So the other thing that I really hope within you know, 50 years is that the ecosystem of competitors become collaborators. And we sort of carve out our specialties within this amazing e ecosystem of, you know, by that time we'll have 10 billion people on the globe who need to be smart and educated, and there's no lack of demand. Julio, anything to add before we go into Q&A? Well, we, it, we, we've been able to build big company without providing uh, any kind of uh, accreditations at all. I mean, actually, in, in, and not only that, it's a true global company. I mean, we, 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 we have customers from every single part of the world. We sell a course every two seconds, and we will never promote ourselves saying that you will get a better job or something like that because you take the, this course. Is, is, is they do it for the pure of joy, the joy of becoming, the, the joy of, of being. So I think the world goes much more in that direction than in that the other one. I mean, I think that um, actually is the community who recognize the value in others. Your identity is not provided by a paper. It's provided by the, ide the identity you have in that context, in that community. So I say that in 50 years, you said, no accreditations at all. And I think that's a great question for the, this whole group here is, is it community or is it credentials? Um, I want to rapid fire. We'll take one or two questions. Um, so let's see. We have help back there. Thanks, Rachel. Um, maybe we'll start over here. And we'll try to keep these real rapid fire because we only have a few minutes. And A little closer. Can you speak louder? So a very quick one. I guess I, I, I can sense what the answer is going to be. But if you're building a global brand, like a platform like Coursera or Upgrad, um, does, does that mean that the brands of the universities get eroded over time? Is this zero sum? In order for you as platforms to succeed, do you need to unwind the brands of the universities longer term? So for those who didn't hear, the question was, in order to build this global brand, do you need to unwind the brands of the universities in order to, to build this brand? Absolutely not. I mean, I, I think that the beautiful thing about uh, a platform approach is you're providing sort of optionality at the scale of the world um, to the best brands for the particular credential or skills or capabilities that you're looking to develop, whether those are university brands or whether those are industry brands or professional associations, the power of the collective is the, is the power of the endeavor. Yeah, absolutely. Again, absolutely no. I think in every single context, when we have been able to build the UpGrant brand, it's been because we've been able to build a very strong brand and word of mouth for the university, right? So we don't work with Ivy League universities that much, which already have a strong brand. But for example, IIIT Bangalore was a very local brand in India in a state called Karnataka. We made them a national brand in India. Liverpool, John Moore's in UK. It's not a great school, but they didn't have a brand or credibility or awareness in India or Southeast Asia. We built that. So we build our brand on the back of building the brands for universities as well globally. Anyone else? 
Okay, we're going to do one more question. Um, I think I saw this hand over here. So if you had a, thank you. If you had to define your company's brand in two or three words, what would that be? That's, that's perfect because we only have time for two or three words. <laughs> so let's go rapid fire. Uh, yeah, let's start with Mike and we'll go down. Uh, future, proof, future proofing the learner. Future proofing the learner. Joy of being alive. <laughs> Joy of being alive. Global lifelong learning company. Inclusion and innovation. Personal journeys to value and purpose. Well, thank you for that final question. Thank you, this panel. Join me in giving a big round thank of you. applause.